Welcome back to the Swim Swim Breakdown. As always, I'm your host, Coleman Hodges, coming to you from Brooklyn, New York. We are joined by Editor-in-Chief Braden Keith from Philadelphia and Associate Editor Tori Hart from Oakland, California. Guys, what's up? Have a good weekend? Downtown, Oakland, California. Coleman, we got to say that every time. (laughs) Sunny, beautiful Oakland, California. Always. All right. Let's get down to some news. First up on our list, we had... So many coaching changes in the past seven days to report. First of which we are going to talk about is Leah Smith moving down to Austin, Texas to train with Carol Capitani and Mitch Dalton at the University of Texas. Tori, thoughts on Leah moving down with the Longhorns? Yeah, I think what's interesting about, you know, all of these coaching changes we've, we've seen, it's, you know, Melanie Margalis, Kathleen Baker, Leah Smith. Um, I think we're also going to touch on uh, Mac Horton is, you know, they're all people who have realistically probably one Olympic games, one Olympic cycle left in them. And there's a couple different things going on. I think Leah and, and Mac are among, um, you know, the swimmers who I think are making a, a career focus change. They're saying, you know, I've got a two and a half year sprint right here. I need to make the coaching change that's best for me. You know, for Leah, she's got Erica Sullivan, Evie Pfeiffer to train with out at um, Texas. And that's a clear to me, clear move, just you know, doing what needs to be done to get back, uh, you know, to that Olympic caliber U.S. roster that she, you know, missed out on this year. And, you know, then you have people like, um, you know, Melanie, who I think from what I understand is more making the move for her out of the pool career and is kind of maybe in the mode where she's um, just staying in shape for ISL or, or some other, you know, smaller meets and maybe isn't looking at the Olympics. And, um, you know, she's training at, at Georgia Tech and with the club team, that's a little bit different situation than, than Leah and the people making the change. Uh, to improve in the pool. So a couple different things going on here, but I think they all are in sort of a similar situation. And for Leah, love this move, love having Erica out there, love having uh, Evie out there with her. It sounds like a, a change of pace that, you know, she needs at this point. And we even saw it with Katie Ledecky. I mean, she obviously had a successful Olympics, but maybe not up to her caliber, but similar situation where she's saying, you know, I have two and a half years here to, to really get the work in that needs to be done and making that move to, to, be with a stronger distance squad it makes a lot of sense. What I think is interesting, and, and most of the names you named, you know, I always feel like I have to be the bad guy on these podcasts, but most of them didn't have a good summer. And they're at an age where it's it's a last chance and they've got to figure out how to get better while they're sort of past what we traditionally think of as the peak prime. They have to figure out how to be faster at 30 than they were at 27 or whatever, you know, whatever the ages are. Um, and, and to me down in Australia, uh, Kaylee McCune is a whole different situation because she was one of the best female swimmers in the world last year. Um, but her coach moved and she is not yet committed to follow him. She's going to give trials to different clubs. And I know Australia is a lot different. There's maybe not the same sort of cultural pressure to stay with your coaches. So maybe it's a little easier to change coaches, in that way. Um, but you know, I think it's a, it's a very different situation. A lot of these changes are athletes at the tail end of their career, like you said, but for Kaylee, she's, she's at the prime of her career and she's, she could be the best in the world at Paris 2024. She could be the headliner of the whole thing. Um, and so that to me is a much more interesting change, especially because as, as Coleman, when he had her on the podcast and her coach, Chris Mooney talked about, they have sort of a different training cycle. They do, what is it, Coleman? Seventeen days on, four days off. It's like a twenty-one day cycle. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's so that's that's worked for her. And and if she goes somewhere else, I would suspect that will change. Um, and so that's that could be a bigger change than what we're seeing for a lot of the swimmers too. Yeah. Also interesting to note that Kaylee's sister trains with Michael Bowl. Um, and so the, t- Taylor McEwen, who's a breaststroke, who's been on the Australian national team for quite some time. And so that could, she seemed to really like training with Michael Bull. She was like, yeah, so far I've been, I thought I was going to be with him for a day. I've been with him for two weeks. seems like a good fit. Um, but she's still doing her trials, but that's, that's another interesting note that, you know, happy swimmers, a fast swimmer. So she could just go join up with family and then boom, you know, be right back into the groove. Do we, I, I mean, so we have a lot, you guys mentioned them. Um, we saw Kathleen Baker at NC state, Kaylee McEwen's doing trials all around Australia. Bronta Campbell's looking for a new coach. Mac Horton joins Michael bull, the gold coast. 
Um, I kind of want to go down the list and, and just get your take on, do, do we, do we think they're going to, they're going to make another Olympics or e- even make it three and a half years with these new coaches? Um, so we'll, we'll go, we'll go sink or swim a little early. Let's start with Leah Smith. Is, is this a, uh, Tori, we'll, we'll go you first. Is this a good, is this a good move? Do we think Leah is going to get back up on the horse and make another Olympic team in 24? It's tough. I think it's a good move. I swim that's a good move. I think that she makes another Olympic team with the young talent coming in, plus Katie still being in the mix come 2024. I, I think the the jury's out on whether it's a still move, a uh, good move. You know, Carol Capitani has made swimmers fast, but she hasn't. She's had a little trouble making swimmers peak at the right meets. Um, but I I don't see it. I think there's too much young talent in her events, and I just don't see it. All right, Kathleen Baker training with NC State. This one was a was a little more in the middle of in terms of career moves versus. Um, out of, out of the pool moves. She's training with NC state. Now she's moved back to North Carolina. We don't know if she's going to keep training with them or what, but do we like the move? Do we like seeing Baker with the wolf pack? Braden? I think it's a great move. Um, you know, training with, um, Catherine Burkoff among others, there will be great for her. Um, I think it's the right move. I still don't think she makes the Paris team. I think, I, I think that's going to be the answer on a lot of these. Yeah, similarly, she's in a rough event to be in right now. In a rough, rough event lineup. So it's not getting any easier. Yeah, I think you know, I'm glad she's switching it up. Seems cool. I think maybe she, I think she got engaged and was maybe moving up there with her with her fiance. So good for her. Um, but yeah, similarly to Leah Smith, I don't think there's a pathway to Paris for her. Interesting. I mean, this, like she was, she was the top top in her events in 2019 and then she just kind of got you know riddled with injuries and sickness i mean do, do we think she could get back to the 2019 form i i think there's a chance you know i'm going to talk i'm going to talk back over myself i think there's a chance in the 200 i am maybe in the 200 back if reagan decides to focus more on the 200 fly than the 200 back um i guess i guess i could see baker getting a spot in one of those events. I don't know that the 200 IM field in the U S is deep enough to block her out. I, I, you know, in my head, I was thinking hundred back because that's where she's the world record. It was the world record holder, but um, we already saw her kind of shifting to the 200 IM. So maybe that's, that's where her opportunity is. All right. Bronta Campbell. Uh, we don't know where her landing spot is yet. I don't think she knows where her landing spot is, is yet Uh double world champion in the 1500 free in 2015. Uh, my question for Bronta <clears throat> is, will she make another Olympic team in 2024? I could see it. You know, the, it's a different, she's a, a sprinter. Um, and Australia is obviously very good and very deep in the sprints, but they only have really one or two young swimmers coming up. Um, so if she stays engaged, I think, I think she could do it. Kind of like her situation was also that she was, you know, she found a spot where she was happy and is now trying to make the swimming work around that. So could be a positive outcome for her there. Uh, Mac Horton joining Michael Bull in the Gold Coast. Uh, Michael Bull has had a lot of success with a lot of Australian athletes do we see he he made the Olympic team in the four by two hundred free relay, uh, in after after missing the four and free, getting third at their trials. Do we see him um, making another Olympic team individually, Tori? I think it's there. I don't really have a, any stats to back that up, but um, you know he showed life after that performance at trials, and again, I think switching it up is usually a good thing at this stage of. Uh, someone's career so sure I'll swim Mac Horton making another Olympic team of these moves aside from Kaylee McEwen obviously um, but I think Mac has the best chance I think they're going to ramp up his training again he's going to start going after the 800 maybe the 1500 again sort of if he's got to let the 200 go a little bit then he's got to let the 200 go a little bit Um, but I think uh, I think he'll make the team in the 800 or the 1500 not the 400 Okay. That's interesting. Can you elaborate on that? Why, why do you, why do you think he'll go up? Cause I, 
I, uh, in a podcast I did with Mac, he said like, he's, he's done with the mile. He's, he's not going to do it. And he's sticking to the 400 free because he's like, he's too big. He's too muscular. Yeah. But I, I feel it's one thing to say that, but I think Michael Bull is going to get him and he's going to look, have a, have a heart to heart with him. I, you know, I guess you could say he wouldn't go to a coach. who's going to push him into an event. He doesn't want to, but I think they'll get through next year. And if he misses the team in the 400 again, they're going to have a heart to heart and say, Mac, if you want to be back in the mix here, if you want to be a, an individual threat, not just sort of a, a relay tag along, um, you have to be realistic about where your chances are. And Australia is very good in the 400 free. Um, they're good in the distance events, but they're very good in the 400 free. So I think that's there's more opportunity in the distance events that the 800 feels like a race to me for him that he hasn't capped out. And that always felt to me like it should be his race. And it wasn't an Olympic race in 2016. But now that it is, that feels like a good target race for me to him. All right. So we're going to move on from uh, from all these different coaching changes uh, to to the young guns ascending. Uh, after the 2021 Olympic Games, most recently Huang Sun Wu of South Korea, 158.0, oh, 200 IM in his second time swimming the event ever. Um, first of all, do you think do you think Huang Sun? This means Huang is is the next Wonderkind, is the next you know Phelps Thorpe kind of guy who can just do it all. He's 47 plus in the 100 free, 144 plus 200 free, and now 158.0, oh, 200 IM. When in an event he's very green in Tori Coleman, Coleman, I believe you mean Wunderkind. <laughs> in spite of what I believe was a forced Ted Lasso reference, the, it, it was not. But yes, <laughs> what Braden said is this guy is this guy the next it guy, Tori? I, mean, I don't want to be too liberal in handing out the next Phelps labels around here. I think Matt Sates can, can stick with that one for now. He's a little bit more range there, but still incredible, incredible range from, from Wong Sun Wu. Like, you know, he was close to the podium in, in the 100 and 200 free in Tokyo. And then, yeah, his second 2IM ever, he bests the South Korean national record by two seconds. That was a Park Taiwan record from 2014. Um, pretty incredible there. Uh, he, his splits were, uh, he was 25, seven, 30.4, 34.9, and then 27, one to close it out. That was, I looked it up faster than any closing split from Tokyo. Pretty impressive out there. Uh, you know, I think we can think of a, a certain American who would love to, love to be able to close out like that. Um, so, I mean, I don't know his second ever, let's see if he can keep it up, but he's definitely in the mix there. And I think um, I would recommend anyone go check out uh, Loretta's article from last week that kind of breaks down these six teenagers, six teenage guys right now who are looking to disrupt the Tokyo field. And, um, you know, we have this short turnaround, like I mentioned before, until, until Paris. And I think these guys are really primed to capitalize on it. Do we think, um, you know, I, I think we all agree that the 158.0 on a second 200 AM was an amazing swim. But the difference from 158.0 to 157.0 and 156.0 is bigger than the difference from 2.00 to 158.0. Maybe the same amount of time, but you know the the way you have to sort of precise those things out, um, you know, because you can get to a 150.0 being a good athlete with good training, but to get that extra second, two seconds, three seconds, he would need to contend in Paris. You've got to put some focus in it. And do we think he can do a one? 155 200 IM without sacrificing a 143 0 200 free. Uh, on an international stage, 158 0 is a great swim. 156 9 will get my attention in terms of will he make international noise? And I think that's a much harder swim to produce. I think, Braden, I agree with the, the half of a good athlete can go 158 0, and he's young and he's got time, but you know, that's a good swim. That's not going to make noise internationally ever right so uh until he goes 156 9 and th that's the territory of okay this this could really be an event that he could swim and medal in and and be a prolific athlete on the international stage in. i'd love to see all those these guys they're all good at other things right um papavici's good at the 50 100 
States is good at all of his different races, but I, it's, it's almost building up, probably not Paris. I, I think they will be too young in Paris, but maybe LA 2028, which again, is going to be, as we talk about, it seems like every week is going to be the primo Olympic stage to end all primo Olympic stages. Um, it's going to be another race of the century. Like when we had Phelps and Hackett and Thorpe and all those guys in, in the 200 free, um, and I know we have particular commenters that hate for us to project young swimmers doing well, but you know, that's the kind of, that's the kind of thing that I think we all salivate over in this sport where we go through these stretches where people just tell us, don't worry about the times, don't worry about the times for months and sometimes years. And so we've got to think about those future races. And to me, that's, that's the one I want to see. Um, you know, we all, we know sometimes swimmers will, dodge races they'll change their focus if they don't think they can win gold and they don't always go after those marquee races the way that some of the rest of us might like to see them do um but that's that's the one for me i'd like to see no i i I disagree Braden. i think 24 is going to be it for for this crop of talent because popovici huang sun Wu already already fine already olympic finalists you know like they were they were like right there in the 200 free. They were both 144. Matt Sates is already 140 short course, you know, Olympic semifinalist in the 200 IM. I, I agree th- that they're going to be good though, but to me to have a race of the century feel, they have to be good in Paris and come back in 2028 with the hype. Because going into 2024, but based on the countries that they're from, this isn't that this is not going to hold. Uh, you know, a Romanian against a South Korean isn't going to hold this giant sort of international appeal, I don't think, until they have medals on their names already. So that leads me to the next question I wanted to ask, which was, out of Huang Sun Wu, Matt Sates, David Popovici, I'm going to go with those three. That Those three have made the most noise in the last four months. Who's going to make the most noise? Who's going to walk away with hardware at this summer? At Carson World Foster. Championships, European, what? Carson Foster. <laughs> well, we can throw Carson in. He's yeah, he's still a teen. Uh, he might be twenty now, but okay, sure. Throw Carson in. Who's gonna make them? Who's gonna walk away with hardware between Euros, between Commonwealth, between World Champs? Who who who's it gonna be? Tori. I feel like I have some some recency bias, but I'm gonna go Matt Say. It's just the versatility. There's so many options there for him, but. I don't know. That could be a little bit. I'm like caught up in the swim swim hype machine, as we as we call it. So that that's some recency bias there. But I'll double down on Mount Saints. I'm going Papavici. I think I think he'll definitely get some Euro hardware because that's not where the the competition for him is right now. Um, I we haven't seen recent success for South Africans coming to the U.S. to train in the American collegiate system. Um, so I do worry a little bit about states coming to Georgia and making that transition. And I think well, Popovici just got a new coach too. Yeah. Well, but he took his, he got a new team. He took his coach with him. Um, okay. Yeah. So in, in Wong, I think might be a year early. I think if, to me, Wong feels like he needs one more year. So if it's this summer, I'm ta- I'm taking Popovici. I think Wong's it. I think he, <laughs> he's going to do it. What he was, he went out like a madman in that Olympic final and it was awesome. And I think he's going to learn from it. I think he's going to come back to worlds and kick everyone's butt. <clears throat> but we, we need to move on. Uh, so that's, that's the young guns. Now let's talk college NCAA saw a flurry of action. We had, we had every team swimming. Um, one of, one of the most appealing stories and, and kind of one of the most surprising stories Washington State women beat Arizona women on the last relay. Braden, uh, is is this more telling for Washington State's program or for Arizona's program? I think to me, the immediate result is more telling for Arizona. Um, but I think the the long term trend is for Washington State. They've they've kind of quietly we saw what Chloe Lars and win the 50 free at Pac-12s last year. You know, winning, winning a Pac-12 title is a big deal, um, especially at Washington State. I, I think Washington State is sort of on a slow creep up and we're going to look up in five years and there'll be a team that's, you know, top 25 at NCAAs. Um, I think Arizona 
Arizona is on a very swift downward path. Um, so I think the immediate result is Arizona, but I think the long term is Washington. I think Matt Leach is doing a great job at building that program sort of the right way in sort of a um, sustainable way, given his resources, given his facility, given no men's team, all those sort of challenges that he's battling, he's building it the right way. Uh, moving on, we, we saw Cal and UVA duke it out in both <laughs> regular distances and non-regular distances, we'll, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, Cal men took the win, UVA women took the win. Um, any, any interesting thoughts from that, especially with, you know, we've talked about UVA women and they're the defending champs. We saw Stanford women in action as well against Utah. And, uh, there were some very different results. Braden, can you take us through those? You know, the, the, the season long conversation on the women's side is Virginia versus Stanford and, Early in the season, Virginia has looked good. You know, Stanford, you, you can't really get a read on where these programs are because if you talk to the coaches, oh, it's all part of the plan. It's part of the plan. This is what we wanted to swim slow. We like swimming slow. We prefer swimming slow. Um, but even compared to themselves, Stanford did not look good. Virginia, to me, the modern swimming is excitement. you got to excite your athletes. You've got to excite your, your recruits. Um, and Virginia is doing things that is ex are exciting people. Um, and Stanford sort of, if we think they're going to come back and challenge Virginia for the title, they will be fighting a wave of momentum. Um, doesn't mean it's not doable, but that's just one more thing you have to fight against. I, yeah, some incredible. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. You I was going to say some some incredible swims out of um, Gretchen Walsh and, and Kate Douglas over the weekend, and it's just like. It's not looking good for Stanford. I don't want to overreact early, but uh, they're clearly taking different approaches this season, as, as Braden said. And uh, I'm really excited to see how it plays out because Virginia is sure looking good. Corey, did it, did I see on your Instagram that you were at the Cal pool last week? No, I was at the UCLA Stanford water polo game. Oh, okay. So, yeah, which was fun too, but yeah. that's a different story. Yeah. Do you, Tori, um, um, Tori, do you think that the Utah effect had an effect on Stanford? And if so, um, how much the Utah effect being that it's their pool is at altitude and that could, you know, make the time slower. I mean, even looking at, at, you know, converted times where we're sort of accounting for altitude, not great out of Stanford, but yeah, I mean, I don't want to attribute it all to that, but this is not their first meet of the season. And, and even, you know, with all of the, the adjustments, they were, they were slower than they were in 2017 when they also uh, swam mid-October at Utah with a, um, I would say, a roster that wasn't as impressive as this one. Uh, so, so next up, um, that was, well, I think it's interesting that we're talking a lot about UVA and Stanford on the women's side. Um, Cal and Texas seem like it's going to be another – pretty momentous battle on the men's side, but no one's, no one seems to talk. No one seems to care. Do you think people are just getting bored with Cal and Texas being one and two at the top? I am. Um, I just, I like NC state is getting so good and, and NC state swimmers love to talk about how good they're getting, but like Cal and Texas are still so good and so deep. It's just like, it's still a, an unbreachable gap. And it's just been that way for so long. I, I'm getting a little bored of it personally. Yeah, I think people will gravitate towards where there's the potential for a little chaos, a little shakeup, and that's definitely women's college swimming right now. Do you do you think it, Brayden? I'll start with you. Do you think it's telling that that of the three men's teams, NC State, Cal, Texas, NC State had the best dual meet this weekend? Yeah, I think that's telling. I think NC State needs the best dual meets. Um, and I think, I think if you talk to Cal in Texas, they would say, well, you know, we've got enough of a pedigree that it doesn't matter what we do in October. People know who we are. NC State is on an upward swing, but they're still trying to show people that they can be Cal in Texas, that they can be competitive with those teams. So they needed to show a little more. Um, it was a great meet by NC State. Um, they were in, in speedos and swimming the kind of times you might think you'd see in um, 
in tech suits at a dual meet. Um, and, and so NC State has momentum, like we talked about with Virginia on the women's side. NC State is going to have momentum, but that's still a big jump they got to make. And, and if they had no pointy, maybe they could do it. But without him, it's just it's it's a battle for third. So you don't think there's any way NC State gets top two this year on the men's side? Coleman, it's like you're trying to get the NC State freshman to go into the comments and yell at me. No, <laughs> I do not think this year. I think they could get there next year or the year after if they land a few more for more recruiting classes like they've had. But no, I don't think this year. Corey, NC State top two. I don't think this year, I think it was, it was Robert who wrote the uh, preview for their season for us. And he broke it down. Well, he made me think that, you know, there's some hope for the very near future, but not immediately, but I recommend his story. All right. Well, fair enough. We're done with NCAA. And on that note, let's play our favorite game here at the swim swim breakdown sink or swim. USA Swimming releases the 2022 International Team Trial Standards, which will happen in Greensboro, April 26th to 30th. Like every big championship meet, they release the cuts. People complain about them. Some think they're too fast. Some think they're too slow. Sink or swim, the World Trials cuts are fair. Uh, I'm going to swim this. I, I think this is part of USA Swimming's continued goals to sort of shrink the selection meets. Um, I think they probably liked what they saw at the Wave 2 cuts. The sessions were a little shorter, a little tighter, um, fewer dead spots in between as you just sort of roll through a dozen heats of the 400 free. Um, so I'm sinking this because I like shrinking the meets. I think it's it's easier to commercialize a smaller meet um, in the, the sort of scale that USA Swimming wants to commercialize them. So I'm swimming. Well, I agree with a lot of those things. I'll sink it because there's, so there's three meets being selected off of this. There's 2022 Worlds, 2022 Junior Worlds, and the 2022 World University Games. That's a lot of meets to, to attribute to one selection meet. Um, Got to loosen up those cuts a little to, to allow for some new names to... Especially given up. the weird timing, the, the unusual yes. sign. Uh, I, it is weird having a trials meet at the end of April. See how that goes. I'm excited to see those results. Next up, the USOPC College Sports Think Tank recommends delaying swim and dive recruiting. Um, I'm interested to hear. I think a lot of people would <clears throat> swim this one, but Braden, let's go to you first. What do you think? Sink or swim? I get the instinct to swim this. Um, first of all, I, I don't really understand what the USOPC's take on this comes from because I don't think the USOPC has an existential crisis with the NCAA stuff going on and programs getting cut, but I'm not sure this decision specifically really impacts that. Um, but regardless, I, I'm going to write a full editorial about this later, but I think there's a dichotomy in recruiting where there's swimmers like Claire Curzon who are every bit ready to make that choice as high school juniors. And then I think there's the wide masses of swimmers who would benefit from delaying it to their, to their senior year. Um, so I don't think just a flat delay is, is going to solve the problem. So I am uh, sinking it. Well, I'll swim it then because I'll, I'll just take the, the obvious stance, which is that giving high schoolers more contrarian. time, yeah, giving high schoolers more time to make their college decisions uh, makes a lot of sense. I'm curious why you say that, you know, Claire Curzon would have been ready to make this decision her junior year when she made it her senior year, right? Like there's, okay, I mean, other fine. than COVID. Fine. Uh, that was a, that was a bad example, but I, <laughs> I just think, I think there are swimmers. What I think if you already are, are clearly on an Olympic track as a junior, um, it's, it's, you don't have that same pressure. You know, the scholarship money is going to be there whenever you decide to take it. But, um, it gives you more time to really evaluate because most swimmers are, are not evaluating their careers based on a swim program. Most swimmers are evaluating their careers based on the academic programs of the school they're going to, but a Claire Curzon or a Tori Husk are most likely going to become professional swimmers. So to me, that's just a, di a very different dynamic than the other 98% of swimmers being recruited every year. Do you, do we think it has, it has worked having the early recruiting, having, you know, unofficials as sophomores, officials as juniors, commitments as juniors, um, you know, it during the senior year, 
you take five recruiting trips or a lot of athletes take, you know, three to five recruiting trips. It kind of messes up their whole senior fall season in terms of swimming. Um, and then they might not perform well their senior season. Do, do, do we think, do we think not having that dynamic right now is a good thing in the early recruiting? I like that dynamic. When I think about when I was in high school, I would have rather done it as a junior and that would have kept me, I think better motivated as a senior. Um, I, you know, I, I, it's all a scholarship thing, right? Like if you take scholarships out of the picture, it almost doesn't matter. Um, so maybe you just, you just start limiting when coaches can actually make offers. Maybe you let, let the kids start communicating with coaches as a junior, but you don't let anybody make any scholarship offers until their senior year. Maybe that's the, the happy middle ground. Problem solved. Done. On to the next one. Uh, off distance dual meets. We've seen a few of these this season, NC state and UNC, uh, Cal and Virginia had one. I didn't, I think UVA and also had one with George Washington, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but we've seen these off distance dual meets. Texas has the Eddie Reese invite every year. 75s of stroke, 150s of stroke, 300s of stroke. Do we like seeing it? Do we think it's helpful as a fan? Do we think it's helpful as athletes? Sink or swim on off distance. I'm going to swim it. It was Georgetown, not George Washington. Um, and, you know, it was, it was a little weird that Virginia flew across the country to do one. Um, I don't know if I, if, if I was on a budget, I would do that. Um, of course they had the regular meet the night before, but I like it. You know, we, we have this conf constant conversation about how much dual meets don't matter. Dual meets don't matter, but this kind of makes them a little interesting more than just a bunch of swimmers going five seconds slower than their best time in the 200 free. So I think it adds a new thing to talk about some new, excitement, some new challenges for the young swimmers out there to see if they can contend with some of these top college swimmers in, in different things. Um, so I'm swimming it. Yeah. Big swim for me too. Super fun, super, I don't know. I think it's, it's some, some lightheartedness, these early season dual meets that truly don't matter, uh, could use. And, uh, I think it, all, all of these sort of off swimming events, stuff that the ISL does as well, I think all play into making swimming more, more fan friendly and more exciting to watch going forward. So definitely a big fan of the off distances. All right. I think that was a bit of a softball. Hopefully this is not, this is, this is a bit of a curveball. we got the college swimming coaches association preseason rankings were out. Obviously Texas Cal at the top for the men, uh, Virginia Stanford at the top for the women. Do they matter? <laughs> do sink or swim do the cscaa preseason rankings tell us anything the sink this the preseason's rankings that come out after the season has begun it's i don't know it's it's they don't tell you that it matters um i am a voter in these polls and i still don't really think it matters there's huge swings throughout the season you know there's basically i could tell you the process on this there's a a small group of coaches who all have their own preferences and sort of um, agendas and in, in hyping their team or under hyping their team for one reason or another. And they come out with a sort of a guideline of where they think teams should be. And it's not mandated to follow those guidelines, but it definitely influences the way people vote. Um, and you get these wild swings that are kind of inexplicable and um, you know, they kind of matter at the top, but the, the reality is that after the few first few teams, there's just so they're so close together um, that frankly, these coaches aren't, they don't have the bandwidth to put the research in to know whether Tennessee is the seventh team or the ninth team or Ohio state is and, and they're not supposed to, right. They're supposed to base it on actual dual meet results, but there's a lot of weird pressures that go into this. So I think them mattering. Um, I don't know. Teams like to make Instagram graphics with their rankings on it, and that's fine. So if it gives them a way to do that, cool. Yeah, basically agreed on all friends. I think, you know, it's fun in college football. You know, rankings are a huge thing in, in college football and college basketball, stuff like that. Kind of fun to have swimming have its own version here. But, yeah, like you said, it, it's very, like, you know, they make it very clear that it's supposed to be based off dual meets and not, you know, necessarily a ranking of where the national standings will be at the end of the season, but then it has Stanford like miles ahead of NC State, which after the dual meets we've seen doesn't really line up. So, yeah, I think it. Do you think it, do you think it helps legitimize swimming as a, as a popular sport? 
I, I see what you're getting at. Um, but if within the sport, people don't trust the polls and I don't think anybody in the sport takes them too seriously other than to just get angry about them. Um, I don't think that <laughs> what else are they for? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think our power rankings do more. Um, schools don't like to, to promote our power rankings as, as much, but I think our power rankings are more aligned with, with what everybody cares about, which is the end of the season. Fair enough. It's hard to know. Yeah. It's hard to know off dual me. It's just because there, as we've seen so many variables, we've got teams suiting up teams in different training cycles. It's not as cut and dry, like a football or water polo where it's just did these teams with the exact same basic conditions beat the other team. It's a lot more simple swimming. It's too subjective. <laughs> I do think though, if, if, you know, a team like NC state, has really good dual meets throughout the season. Like they go into NCAAs ranked number one. Sure, we might know what what the outcome of, of the NCAAs might be, but I think it would make it more exciting if something like that happened. If if you know if a school has really fast dual meets all season, I think we should notice them more and we should say, okay, they, it looks like they're having a really good season, even if they you know blow the taper. If they if they do that seven years in a row, then sure. We say, Oh, okay. We know that they're not going to perform, but it could be kind of cool. Just trying to make things more exciting. Anyway, last sink or swim PD versus Pernilla week. I don't know, seven, six, eight, who knows? Uh, Adam PD had the best week he's had on his respective British dancing show, earning the second highest score with an Argentine tango while Pernilla samba her way to the highest score on the Danish dance show yet. Uh, who had the better week, Petey or Pernilla? Braden? Swimmers are taking over. Swimmers are taking over the friggin' world. Uh, I think Pernilla, I think she's good at this. Like, I think she could do this as a career. It seems like every week she gets so much better. Um, so whatever they're doing is working. She's got a feel for it. She seems to have a natural kind of vibe for the music, which is super cool to see. Um, I think PD, we're going to see an up and down season. Like we've seen so far, I think he's going to have a great week. He's going to have a terrible week. I think there are certain dances he'll be great at and certain dances he'll struggle with because of his build. Um, I think PD, I think Pernilla is, is the future of dancing with swimmers which will be a new television show produced by Swim Slam in 2022. Um, I thought PD's, I, I think whoever did the graphics for his, for his performance kind of did him dirty. That that pool at the beginning was a little heavy handed. It's like, we get it. He's a swimmer. <laughs> you don't need to put him in a pool projected on the stage. I think that didn't do many favors with me. I was just like, ugh. But it did, did it remind everybody of Adam PD, the Olympic hero? I mean, it could have been more subtle, though. They could have been more subtle, more artful about it instead of just a literal. I don't think subtlety is yeah. really the thing on dance shows. <laughs> that's, uh, that's fair. But I, I mean, I do agree. I think Pernilla is better. PD, I felt like his partner was doing a lot of the, the, the hard work in this in this dance. He kind of was uh, showing where he was lacking a little bit. And she just looked, Pernilla just looked so comfortable. I loved her jumpsuit. It looked like a, like a training swimsuit in the back, kind of, which just... The vibe was good. The subtleties, the subtleties were good. I mean, that's good coaching though, right? Like if you were Adam Petey's dance coach and he was dancing with, with his partner, I'd tell her to do all the work too. Y'all are such Petey haters. I think Petey had the better week. I agree. Pernilla is better at this as a whole, but her routine, their routine was fun. It was light. It was, it was, but it was, I thought it was a little weak and uh, Petey's routine, lots of lifts, Lots of strength. Uh, lot of the, it took a lot of skill on his part for sure. And I think he had the better week of dancing this week. Okay, fine. Coleman, you're wrong, but that's fine. Do we need to revisit? Is he going to miss the rest of the ISL <laughs> season because he does so well on this show? <laughs> I, I <clears throat> yeah, we do. <laughs> Braden, what do you think? You I, you've I been hot think- and cold. I don't think he's going to swim. I don't think he's going to swim ISL either way. At this point, there's not enough money to motivate him to go do it. But uh, I think, no, I think Adam P is going to have one week too bad. The competition's getting tougher every week. I sound like I work for the BBC right now, but I think Adam Petey, 
I think he's got next week and then one more and he'll be done. Corey. I think he I think he definitely goes deep enough to miss the season or I'm I'm rooting for that just because that's a hilarious outcome of this whole thing. I mean, you can't can't script that better. That's just perfect. So, I'm rooting for that. I think we yeah. can all agree that they're all better than Ryan Lochte. Yeah. <laughs> no arguments can there. There's no way he yeah, there's no way he shows up in Eindhoven at the ISL. Do do we think he would show up for the the playoff, the final, the ISL final? Do we want him to? That's like one of my least favorite things about the ISL is that they can just bring in stars for yeah. one. Yeah, I mean, yeah. like as much as I loved seeing Diaseto break the four IM world record in Vegas, it was like, yeah. come on, <laughs> like he's yeah. he's not on your team. Yeah, it's it it just it serves to for further kind of delegitimize the ISL format if he shows up. So. Let's let's have him stay in the UK and keep dancing. All right, fine. I take Adam Petey to win the entire thing. Another goal again. <laughs> All right. Well, that that is this week's news in swimming. Thanks for tuning into the Swim Swim Breakdown. We will see you next week.